Developing right now on Morning News Now, tens of thousands of auto workers ready to strike. This morning, talks between Detroit's big three car makers and the United Auto Workers Union stuck at a standstill. And now with a midnight deadline looming, auto workers say they're ready to walk off the job. We're still very far apart on our key priorities. To win, we're likely going to have to take action. We have team coverage with the latest on talks, the biggest roadblocks, and how a strike could cost the country billions. Also captured this morning, a fugitive killer is back behind bars after a nearly two-week manhunt. Now we're learning more about what finally helped authorities track him down and how he eluded them for so long. Plus, out of the running new developments from Capitol Hill, Senator Mitt Romney says he will not run for a second term. His announcement and his message to President Biden and Donald Trump ahead of the 2024 election. Plus, President Biden addressing an inquiry into his impeachment for the first time, what he said at a private event. And he's changing the game. Now linebacker Carl Nassib, the NFL's first openly gay player, is retiring from football. He'll join us to talk about his seven seasons in the league, his legacy on and off the field, and what is next for him? A conversation you're going to bring us later this morning. Exactly. He's an inspiration to so many people. Tough decision to actually retire mm. from football. Excited to talk with him about that and what's next for him. Definitely. All right. Mm. Good morning. Good to have you with us on this Thursday. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started this morning with the deadline for what could be a crippling strike for the U.S. auto industry. The United Auto Workers are set to carry out targeted strikes at certain plants at midnight tonight if it does not reach contract deals with major automakers. We're talking about General Motors. Motors, Ford, and Chrysler parent company Stellantis. Among the union's demands, more pay, better benefits, and a shorter work week. Both sides are making it clear they're ready for what could be a first-of-its-kind walkout at all big three automakers at once. And the impact of this could have huge repercussions for the U.S. economy. We're going to have full team coverage of this potentially historic strike. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung will join us in a moment with a closer look at worker pay and where both sides stand. But let's be begin with NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch in Detroit. The United Auto Workers at the Big Three are getting ready to walk off the job. If we don't have a fair contract by midnight on Thursday night, we will strike. A strike looming from union halls outside Detroit to a plant in Kokomo, Indiana. Me and my wife, we struggle. We try to make ends meet to take care of our four kids. The union demanding a 46% pay raise compounded over four years, plus better benefits. UAW President Sean Fain said GM, Ford, and Stellantis are now offering between 17 and 20% pay raises over four years. I go on strike for anything to make sure that the, the folks that are coming in after me are going to have a, a livable wage and a, a future. Like this was a career when I first started and now it's just a job. According to CNBC data for U.S. based auto workers, labor costs Tesla an estimated $45 an hour. Foreign automakers pay $55 to $60 an hour. But the big three shell out as much as $67 an hour. How much longer can union labor for your company be sustainable when you look at what other manufacturers are doing? We bet on America. We bet on the UAW. We believe that this is the right bet. Ford CEO says his company isn't backing down. We're absolutely ready for a strike. The UAW says a strike will be what it calls a stand-up strike, where just a portion of its roughly 146,000 big three auto workers walk off the job at specific facilities. The impact could be just as great as if you shut down the entire company, because if there are no engines, no transmissions, that essentially shuts down final assembly. A stand-up strike would limit how many workers get strike pay. That can make the UAW's money last longer and drag out a strike. Back to you. All right, Jesse. Jesse, thank you so much. And now let's bring in NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung on this. Hey, Brian, so wages are obviously this major sticking point, as they often are when a strike looms. But what else are they disagreeing on, and where does talk stand at this point? Yeah, well, let's talk about where we stand here when we talk about what the UAW is asking for. They're asking for a 46% wage bump that's compounded over the next four years. And the best available offer that we're aware of at this time was a 14.5% wage bump coming from Stellantis, the maker of Chrysler vehicles. In addition, 
addition to that, the UAW is asking for automatic inflation adjustments. They've been saying the rising cost of living is the reason why they're asking for such an aggressive number, whereas a lot of the automakers have offered a one-time bonus payment. And the last sticking point that we're talking about here, a 32-hour work week. That is something the UAW has been asking for instead of a 40-hour work week. Instead, the offers from the automakers as of right now would be to offer Juneteenth as a paid holiday. That might amortize maybe a fewer uh, shorter work week over the 52-week period. But again, you can see just how far apart they are, at least as of right now, that we're aware of. So, Brian, how do auto workers fare compared with some other workers in the economy? Yeah, well, naturally, if they're asking for that aggressive of a number in terms of wages, well, it begs the question, how far do they lag behind the broader industry? Well, if we take a look at the overall economy, right, we've seen that the average wages for uh, the American worker is $33.82 an hour. In the motor vehicle parts and workers industry, which, by the way, covers both union and non-union work, that's only $27.99. Now, again, what we're looking at here is kind of a pre-pandemic 2019 to 2023 period. We've seen wages grow by about 14 percent in this industry, roughly 15 percent. We've seen the overall worker wages increase by 19 percent, so they're lagging. But we have to remember inflation over this period has been 17 percent. That underscores a big reason why these motor parts, uh, the automotive workers have been asking for such an aggressive wage increase. So, Brian, just sort of reading the tea leaves for us, I mean, how likely are we to see this strike by this time tomorrow? Yeah, well, it doesn't look good right now. And one last point I want to bring up here is just kind of talking about the uh, CEO pay median worker bit. Uh, what we've seen from the UAW is strong rhetoric and saying we feel like we deserve more money because the companies have done very well. The CEO at GM over the 2018 to 2022 period, their pay has gone up by over 30 percent at four to 18 percent. Take a look at the median worker over that period of time again a big uaw talking point only three percent during that period of time 16 percent over at ford stellantis we don't have that data because they are a, a netherlands-based company uh they're actually in, based in amsterdam so because of that we don't have those figures there but their ceo pay is quite high as well all right brian chung as always we appreciate you thanks so much to Capitol Hill now, and NBC News has learned that the Republican lawmakers leading the House impeachment inquiry into President Biden have briefed Senate Republicans about it. Representatives James Comer and Jim Jordan made the presentation yesterday afternoon, according to multiple GOP sources. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin joins us now. So, Julie, what do we know about this briefing and how was it received by the Senate Republicans who were there? Yeah, hey, good morning, Joe. Well, look, my colleague and I spoke to half a dozen senators who were in that room who heard the presentation from James Comer and Jim Jordan, who McCarthy had tasked with leading this impeachment inquiry into the president. And I got to tell you, they're really warming up to this idea. Now, the meeting was focused on logistics, on process. There was a lot of procedural questions, including timeline. Some senators pushed back, warned Jordan and Comer to make sure they were methodical about their investigation, about their inquiry, not to, ru not to rush anything. Comer and Jordan had said they wanted a fast trial. Senators in the room uh, had told them to maybe slow down to make sure there's appearance of public trust when it comes to this investigation. Overall, though, I talked to Senator Kevin Kramer, for example, who said that the evidence they laid out was overwhelmingly convincing. He did tell me there were some senators in the room who had questions. Did this actually connect to the president? Did his son's actions actually prove that President Biden was involved in anything? That remains to be seen on our end, but certainly Senate Republicans in the room were pretty convinced. So, Julie, we understand President Biden has addressed the impeachment inquiry off camera for the first time since House Speaker Kevin McCarthy announced it earlier this week. What's he saying? Yeah, this was really unusual for Biden, who tries to sort of stay away from all these matters. He always said that he defends his son. But other than that, he didn't really engage on this issue. Of course, we know, as NBC News reported, he's been gearing up for this for months. He has a war room in his White House of lawyers. Yesterday, speaking at a fundraiser in McLean, Virginia, just about 35 minutes to 40 minutes away from uh, where I am here in D.C., he said, look, I'll tell you why, but I don't know. They just wanted to impeach me. And now the best I can tell, he said they want to impeach me because they want to shut the government down. Of course, Biden here referring uh, to this potential concession that McCarthy made to some of his hard right members in order to get them to vote for a short term government funding bill. There's often talk that these two matters are linked. We just reported, however, that conservatives aren't too happy with the fact that they're being tied together. They don't want to feel that pressure. Biden, though, went on to say, so look, I got a job to do. Everybody always asks me about impeachment. He says, I get up every day, not a joke, not focused on impeachment. He says his focus is to make sure he's working for the American people every single day. It'll be interesting to see what else he says, whether he comes to the defense of his son. But uh, so far, these are his first comments since McCarthy announced this impeachment inquiry. Certain, 
certainly important to note. And a reminder, when we talk about the other pressing issue, it's September 14th, and lawmakers have until the end of the month to get that budget deal taken care of. Julie, let's turn to the other big story on Capitol Hill. That's Utah Senator Mitt Romney, who announced yesterday he won't be seeking re-election next year. He's not going to be looking for a second term. Talk to us about why he's stepping down. Well, there's a couple of reasons. And look, I was part of that lengthy gaggle that he held with reporters when he uh, let us kind of pick through all the questions on our minds for why he could be leaving. And one of the main things he laid out was actually his age. He's in his mid-70s. He said he doesn't want to be in his 80s at the end of his second Senate term. This is a guy who came in serving just one term in the Senate. Obviously, we know his history as a governor, as a former uh, nominee for the presidential uh, nomination for Republicans in 2012. He came in. He worked across the aisle. He was certainly uh, some of the ire that was thrown at him from the former president. He was an outspoken critic of Trump. Take a listen to what else he said in terms of the divide of the parties here. Watch. But I do think that, that the times we're living in really demand the next generation to step up and, uh, and express their point of view and to make the decisions that will shape our American politics over the coming century. And just having a bunch of guys who were around, the baby boomers, who were around in the post-war era, we're not the right ones to be making the decisions for tomorrow. Now, obviously, his comments about age are notable. We've been talking a lot about Minority Leader McConnell, about Senator Dianne Feinstein, these lawmakers who are in their 80s and 90s, but also the current president, 81. Former President Trump, also expected to be the frontrunner for Republicans, Romney said it would be great if both of them actually stepped aside, too. He also told me at the end that President Biden actually called him yesterday, and he was very generous and kind in his comments, Joe. Are we getting a sense from his comments of how much Trump and Trump's hold on the GOP is playing into this decision? Because, I mean, Senator Romney, if he wanted to get reelected, probably is going to get reelected in Utah, right? Absolutely. And he said as much. He said that he had no concerns that he would get reelected. He touted his poll numbers in the state as well. Look. Certainly, the former president uh, has something to do with it here, right? Romney has often talked about, including in a book that's set to come out about his uh, biography in a couple of months, uh, how he was the only one in public really going out on a limb, talking about the former president, being honest about the former president. Uh, and certainly some of that played into his decision, whether he wants another cycle of that if the former president was back in the White House. But on that token, Joe, just really quickly, I, I actually asked him, wouldn't it be better if he had stayed in the Senate to be that voice? And he said there's plenty of people who can do that on his behalf. There's many people who can step up and also work across the aisle. And by the way, he thinks that young Republicans differ from that MAGA wing, those MAGA supporters that the former president certainly has a firm grip on. Julie Sirk and Julie, thank you so much. Well, we are continuing to track Hurricane Lee as it makes its way up the Atlantic for a closer look. Let's get a check at your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lassman joins us now. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Does it feel like we've been talking about Lee forever? Because I feel like that. And we've still got a long way to go, at least through this weekend, where we'll finally start to see some of those impacts for parts of the United States and parts of Canada. Here's the latest details with that system. 100 mile per hour winds that puts it at a category two and moving due north at nine miles per hour right now, still sitting to the southwest of Bermuda, but folks there are going to start to see some of those impacts as we get into the later parts of today and into early tomorrow. I'll show you that here in a moment with the track. Here's those latest alerts. We do have watches in effect. So tropical storm watches and hurricane watches. The hurricane watches in the pink right there. We're going to see these lasting through at least the next couple of days, at least into your weekend from Maine down to Rhode Island. So a heads up there. That means that we'll be having the potential to see some of those tropical storm conditions as we get into Saturday and Sunday. Here's the latest track just as we get to the west of Bermuda. You know, we're sitting at a category one by early tomorrow morning. We're seeing 90 mile per hour winds. Uh, just a note, parts of the southeast, you're going to continue to see that really rough surf along the coast. The coastal erosion is going to be an issue, as well as those elevated rip current risks. That's going to be something we deal with at least for the next couple of days. So staying out of the water is going to be really a good bet here for the extended period. Now, when we talk about the direct impacts, it still does include parts of that track. Uh, extreme portions of eastern Maine, uh, down east Maine, we're going to see places like Bar Harbor to Halifax, still in the potential to see the center of that system come on shore. But notice the, the impacts are far reaching when we talk about tropical storm force winds. These tropical storm force winds extend more than 300 miles out from the center of the system by the time we get into Saturday and Sunday. So just because the center of it is well off to your east doesn't mean folks in Nantucket can't see some of those really strong, even gusty winds that could cause some down power lines or some down trees as we get into your Saturday and into your Sunday. 
The strongest winds, of course, will be closer to the coast, closer to that system. Bar Harbor said to head to the, maybe the 60s. We'll see some 40s in there, some 50s for Fall River. Nantucket could see a peak wind gust of up to 70 miles per hour. So no surprise, again, if we see some power outages with this system. It is such a large system, and with a large system moving through portions of the Atlantic, it's going to bring a lot of water with it, too. So we do have a concern for storm surge. Exactly how this plays out will be uh, something that we'll have to watch closely uh, because we do have the potential to see anywhere from one to three feet for more of a widespread area from uh, especially up into portions of Maine. And then notice uh, Cape Cod Bay, we could see anywhere from two to four feet, play, places like Provincetown, Easton. We're going to see uh, potentially some issues with this, especially as we get to that high tide time. We'll see uh, places like the Fundy Bay that has the highest tides in the in the whole world. And the system is going to move on shore right near there. So we'll have to watch and see exactly how those dynamics play out. Rain, really the least of our concerns with this, but we still could see places down East Maine getting up to maybe five inches. So we'll see the flooding concerns possible. Um, but especially, guys, I think the winds and the storm surge are going to be the things that we'll really have to watch as we get into Saturday and into Sunday, of course. We've been waiting so long for this thing it, to move. <laughs> is, it is not going away anytime soon. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Angie, thanks so much. Of course. After nearly two weeks on the run, a dangerous escape prisoner in Pennsylvania is now back in police custody. Police say Danello Cavalcante was apprehended yesterday. He was already convicted of murdering a former girlfriend. Now he faces additional charges for the manhunt that received national attention, putting a community on edge. NBC News correspondent George Solis has been on this from the beginning. He joins us now from the location where they captured Cavalcante yesterday in Pennsylvania. George, good morning. So he's now back in custody. Recap for us how this all unfolded about 24 hours ago. Yeah, good morning, Joe. It all unfolded in dramatic fashion in these woods behind me when those tactical teams had to wait out a storm before making their move. And Cavalcante did not go down without a fight. But in the end, authorities managed to get their man. He was in this new 8 to 10 square mile perimeter that authorities believe he had moved to after stealing a van after leaving the original search perimeter near the botanical gardens known as Longwood in uh, Lower Chester County. At that point, he had changed his appearance. He had shaven. We are now learning he found that razor in a bag that he had stolen from somewhere around this area. So a plane with thermal imaging got a heat signature in this area around 1 a.m. That plane had to leave because of that storm that I just mentioned. But those teams knew they were moving in to seal the deal. They brought in a canine identified as Yoda and that canine reportedly taking a bite out of Cavalcante to make sure he didn't go anywhere. Authorities later clarifying that he did sustain a bite wound. Then he's put into a wagon there and then transported to a police barrack in Avondale, uh, Pennsylvania. And then this morning he is waking up at a maximum security prison in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. In all, this has been a two week manhunt that has terrorized the community. A lot of people were growing skeptical whether or not state police were ever going to capture this guy. And we now know, based on some new information post interview of his arrest, that he was planning on using a stolen rifle he had gotten from this area to try and carjack someone to try and get to Canada. Joe? Yeah, George, I want to ask you more about that. I mean, I guess while in custody, authorities say Cavalcante did speak. He came clean about how he managed to evade police for so long and about his plans to try and leave the country. What did he say to law enforcement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are some of the big questions that a lot of people had. How, how did he survive in, in these woods for as long as he did? And he told authorities in that post uh, arrest interview that he found watermelon from a nearby farm and was eating that. He hid waste in strategic areas to make sure he wouldn't go detected. He drank water, as we a lot of us assume here, since there are a lot of creeks from the areas around here. And then he just moved around at night. Of course, we all know that it was really, really hot during the uh, search days in the especially on the onset of those days so maybe the thermal imaging wasn't working yet authorities really haven't cleared that component of it up but he was obviously moving around very strategically but authorities knew that he would eventually make a mistake they would hope that he would eventually slip up and it seems that once he got into this new location had stolen that rifle it was really just a matter of time so again very interesting details uh, as far as the where he got the razor to change his appearance how he survived out here and where he was basically holed up up until the very moment of his capture joe and george police say cavalcante is supposed to appear in court later this month real quickly what's next for him so as far as we know, authorities do have that court date for him on September 27th, where he will basically be arraigned on the charges for the escape. But then this morning, he is waking up at SCI Phoenix. It is a maximum security prison here in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Authorities, though, telling us they have not yet decided where he will 
carry out the remainder of his life sentence. Joe. Right. George Solis, great work over the last two weeks. Hopefully you can get mm -hmm. some rest soon. Let's bring in NBC News terrorism analyst Jim Cavanaugh for more on this. He's also ret retired ATF special agent in charge and a former hostage negotiator. Jim, good morning. So let's walk through some of those techniques, and I'd like to get your reaction to them about how they were actually able to zero in on Cavalcante's location. We've heard about this thermal imaging, the police dog involved. Just tell us about your reaction to what we've heard so far about how they did this. Well, it was textbook, really, Savannah. What they do is you have to have a leadership you set up the structure and resources. They didn't turn down any help. The state police in Pennsylvania have 4,700 troopers, yet they still needed the help, and they were smart enough from their past manhunts to get and accept all that help from city, county, state, and federal agents to move in, work together, set up the perimeter, a double perimeter, and then work steady, steady, leveraging the public to help them. And they got the break from the alarm, where they could send the, the SWAT teams over to that location. Uh, they sent the DEA fixed wing aircraft with the uh, infrared radar. They saw the heat signature at night of a human in the field. They were chased away by the thunderstorm, but then they had the uh, SWAT teams in the, in the immediate area. They brought the plane back, uh, zeroed in on them, and uh, made the capture. So good work, strong leadership, structure and resources, textbook case, uh, good work all around. Mm -hmm. We've heard so much about this concept of the perimeter, uh, not only mm -hmm. that Cavalcante was able to break through that search perimeter, what seems like twice, but then also, of course, how they kind of sort of tightened it up, kept narrowing in, and we heard a couple days before the capture about, about the size of that and all that kind of stuff. Just walk us through what goes into setting up a perimeter in a search like this and how important that ultimately was to have an area that they were zeroed in on. Yeah, I think people have an unrealistic view of what a perimeter is. Look, this guy can escape a walled prison yard with razor wire and towers. It's not that hard to get out of a perimeter, a police perimeter, that's set up. Look at these officers. Where's the next car? You know, it's a quarter mile down the road. And uh, maybe the officers can see each other. Sometimes there's curves in the road. And so, you know, at night in a brushy area like this, a man can just wait and run across the road. I've had cop killers do that when I've had perimeters that I've been uh, in charge of with uh, you know hundreds of agents and troopers, and they can slip through. So it's not unusual that they slip through. I think what's we have to have a realistic belief of what a real perimeter is in areas that are this large. Mm -hmm. The police did an extraordinary job here. Uh, when they located him, or he did the, uh, he was spotted on a camera or uh, during the theft of uh, the rifle, they, they moved their resources closer, they readjusted their perimeter, they had a double perimeter. Uh, look, uh, they needed some luck too, and they got some luck because the dairy van he stole ran out of gas. All right. And if the dairy van he stole did not run out of gas, the keys were left in it. He could have been in Canada or Mexico and slipped the perimeter. So it takes a little luck too, uh, as the mm. old uh, Yankees coach said, Branch Rickey, uh, luck is the residue of design. And they designed it to catch him, and uh, it, was a good, it was good work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jim, finally, before I let you go, if we could just kind of go back to the beginning of this. I mean, we know it took about an hour before prison guards even realized that he had escaped. We've seen the video, of course, of that kind of amazing crab walk he did up the wall. Here it is on the screen again. We also know this isn't the first time there's been an escape from this facility. They have discussed changes they'll make. They made changes after this had happened before. But what really needs to go on here in order to prevent something like this from happening again at this particular location? Common sense. <laughs> uh, a prisoner escaped the exact same way in May. And you got this cubby hole there where, you know, maybe it's not in view of the guard tower. And uh, they could have built a brick wall there for you know, some thousands of dollars. Instead, we spent millions and millions chasing a guy all over uh, hell and half of mm. Pennsylvania. So it, it, it takes some common sense. It takes the county commissioners in the county uh, that supervise that prison to say, yeah, we, we're going to have to spend some money here. Let's build a brick wall. Let's tighten this up. Let's not have these hidden chambers in the, in the exercise yard. And uh, then we won't have to deal with this. But sometimes uh, wardens and sheriffs have a hard time getting the funds out of the county. Uh, people don't want to do it. Mm. They don't want to spend the money. But mm. it's pay me now or pay me later. So give those wardens and sheriffs some money they need to keep these guys in there to keep us all safe. All right, Jim Cavanaugh. Thanks as always.
Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, he made history, but that wasn't the mission. Hear from the American astronaut who broke the record for the most days living in space. Oh, well, cool. Up first, though, after the break, desperation in Libya, where hope is fading in the search for survivors after days of deadly flooding. We'll be right back. We're back with more from Nightly News anchor Lester Holt's exclusive interview with Iran's president. That's right. This time it's about the war in Ukraine and allegations that Iran was supplying Russia with drones to use in the conflict. Take a listen. Let me turn to the issue of uh, the war in Ukraine and Russia and drones. Can you be as clear as you can about what Iran's military relationship is with Russia right now, especially as it pertains to drones, Iranian drones? We have connections with different uh, countries, economic relations, trade relations with Russia. We have a trade and economic relations. We have defensive relations and defense cooperation. We had and we have no role in Russia, Ukraine war. Ukraine claims it's it shot down perhaps two dozen Iranian-made drones. They have recovered wreckage and linked it to Iran. Do you discount that, what, what the U.S. calls, uh, I think, undeniable proof? I followed this issue, and I had some conversations with Eastern Europe uh, officials. I asked Ukraine if they have any documents they should provide with us. Till now, they have failed in providing any documents with us regarding Iran's role in delivery of the weaponry to the Ukrainian war by Iran. Another portion of my interview with Iran's President Ebrahim Raisi. Back to you. All right, Lester Holt, thank you very much. Now to Libya, where the search for survivors continues following those catastrophic floods. More than 8,000 people have died, and officials say that number is likely to rise even higher. Mm -hmm. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter has the latest. The Libyan Navy pulling bodies out of the sea, struggling against the surf in the coastal city of Derna. Helicopters joining the recovery effort. The massive flooding in eastern Libya has claimed more than 8,000 lives, according to Libyan authorities. The exact toll unclear, an additional 10,000 people still missing. This man shouting, my sister, her sons, her daughter, and granddaughter. 11 people in his family, all dead, he says. Disaster in every sense of the word. Over the weekend, Storm Daniel brought nine months of rain in just six hours, bursting through two dams. Satellite images show the coastline before and after. Drone footage captures the scale, one-third of Derna wiped out. This resident saying bodies have been buried in mass graves. The cemeteries are all full. This man in neighboring Egypt, distraught, he lost four members of his family. Humanitarian aid now coming into the country too slowly and years of chaos, division and war have left the country vulnerable. The U.N. says more than 30,000 people have been displaced from their homes. Molly Hunter, NBC News. More international news now in Vietnam. A massive fire in an apartment building has killed dozens of people. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us with the latest on that and some other world headlines. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. Officials in Vietnam say the fire broke out in Hanoi in the middle of the night in a nine-story apartment building, killing at least 56 people, including several children. Dozens more were also injured. Now, witnesses say some of the building's 150 residents tried to jump from their windows to escape. The Ministry of Public Security say police have detained the owner of the building, accusing him of violating fire prevention regulations. Now let's come back here to the shores of Italy, where a new wave of migrants have arrived. Starting early Tuesday, around 6,800 migrants came to Lampedusa, a small fishing and tourist island just south of Sicily, in a span of just 24 hours. And yesterday, a fleet of crowded boats coming from Tunisia overwhelmed the same island, causing strain for the Coast Guard. Political pressure is now mounting on Italy's first female premier, Giorgia Meloni, who pleaded to crack down on the ongoing migrants crisis and we end our tour in Mexico where ET might have made a quick stop 
Well, you heard it right. The Mexican Senate is hearing testimony on extraterrestrial life. The testimony say, quote, we are not alone. We are not alone. At the hearing, lawmakers were shown to alle two alleged non-human mummies with shriveled bodies and small hands. These remains are said to be more than a thousand years old, though some studies suggest these mummies are fraudulent. The event was inspired by the U.S. congressional hearing in July, where a retired major alleged the U.S. was hiding a secret UFO program. Even though, guys, it looks like it was more inspired by E.T. the movie, because yeah. that guy looks just like him. Yeah, the, the hearing in Mexico, a little more dramatic than the one in the U.S. <laughs> they had aliens. Um, interesting. Right. All right. Claudio, thank you so much. Thanks. Coming up, a global superstar now facing death threats from what appears to be Mexican cartel. More on the messages that are causing so much concern. And drama off the set. Actress Drew Barrymore facing fallout as production of her talk show resumes. Despite the Hollywood strike, this is Morning News Now. Musician Peso Pluma made history Monday night, becoming the first regional Mexican act to perform at the VMAs. But those celebrations were overshadowed by death threats that seemed to originate from a Mexican cartel. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas has the details. Mexican superstar Beso Pluma topping the charts, but now with a potential target on his back. Banners found early Tuesday on bridges in Tijuana, Mexico, warning the singer not to perform at an upcoming concert in the city, signed with the initial CJNG, which belonged to the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, one of the three fighting for power in the city. The banners discovered just hours before Peso Pluma's historic performance at the VMAs in New York, even Taylor Swift dancing to his music, which in 2023 rose to the top of the charts worldwide. Oh, you are, you are the legend. Come on, bud. There's a liner on the block. Three times there for you today. The artist becoming the first to perform Mexican regional music on The Tonight Show. <laughs> Selling out shows across Mexico and the U.S. And in May, Peso Pluma telling Top Story his music was transcending languages. We are surprised that that our music is getting to the to the global charts as number one. But his earlier hits include lyrics about the Sinaloa cartel and its former leader El Chapo Guzman, the biggest rival of the Jalisco New Generation cartel. No sabemos si son del crimen organizado o no, porque también pueden ser algún ciudadano, eh, algún ciudadano que no le guste esta música. Authorities say they are working to confirm if the cartel is in fact responsible for the banners. Y en los próximos días, Tijuana Mayor Montserrat Caballero says an investigation led by state authorities will determine if Peso Pluma's upcoming concert is canceled. Just months ago, Mexican band Grupo Arriesgado, who also have lyrics glorifying the Sinaloa cartel, canceled the show in Tijuana after they too received death threats. In an event days before, gunshots could be heard as they signed autographs for fans. And in the early 90s, singer-songwriter Chalino Sanchez, who was an early pioneer of the narco corrido genre, was shot and killed hours after a concert in Sinaloa, where he was famously passed a note on stage. No one has ever been arrested for his murder. Beso Pluma's concerts outside of Chicago and in Indianapolis scheduled for this weekend have been postponed or canceled. It's unclear if it's connected to the threats. NBC News reached out to Beso Pluma and his team who have not addressed the issue or responded with comment. Our thanks to Guad Venegas for that report. Well, actress Drew Barrymore is receiving backlash for resuming production of her talk show, even as the writers and actors strike drags on. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has more. Back at work and under fire. This week, Drew Barrymore announcing she has restarted her daytime talk show, even as striking writers and actors protest outside her studio. Looking so gorgeous. Which While SAG actress says the actress is free to host her show, show the Writers Guild of America says Drew's show is planning to return without WGA writers. She's either returning with uh, substitute writers or she's improving, but either way, the Writers Guild wants to maintain as much solidarity and as much unanimity 
as possible. After long expressing solidarity with strikers, Barrymore now says, I own this choice and maintains she's in compliance with strike rules. The Hollywood drama unfolding just as the Jennifer Hudson show and the talk also reportedly make their return to television. It is day two of the writer's strike. The View, part of ABC News, never stopped production. With the writer's strike in its fifth month and the SAG after strike in its third Third, there is concern over how long support will last amid a stalemate in negotiations. Hundreds of picketing strikers and actors were warned even more productions could resume amid their strike. It's hard. It's very hard. And with the passing of time, it's going to even get harder. With no end in sight to the strike, writers are spelling out their frustration as some return to work. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Hollywood. Well, coming up, a debate amid the devastation. Up next, why officials in Maui say it's time to welcome back tourists after last month's massive fire, while some residents say it's way too soon. And he's saying farewell to football. Linebacker Carl Nassib retiring from the NFL after making history as the league's first openly gay player. I'm going to talk to him about that decision and what's next for him coming up on Morning News Now. Welcome back. In an effort to boost the economy after those devastating wildfires, Hawaii's governor has announced West Maui hotels will reopen early next month, but some residents feel it is too soon. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has more. Five weeks since the devastating Maui wildfires, the island with an economy reliant on tourism is still grappling with how and when to reopen. What's going to happen? when their time at the hotels run out. At an emotional city council meeting Tuesday night, some business owners begged for tourists to return. It's like we suffered a heart attack. We fell down the stairs and we broke our arm. So Lahaina is definitely the heart of Maui right now. But while we have to attend to the heart, we still have to attend to the broken arm which is the rest of Maui's economy. But others are arguing that now is not the time. I understand the push and the need for an economic recovery, but right now we're not prioritizing the right people. State officials recently announced a plan to reopen West Maui on October 8th, two months after the unprecedented fires that tore through the west side of the island and decimated the historic city of Lahaina. 115 people have been confirmed dead. At least 66 are still missing. Thousands remain displaced. This push to reopen coming as Maui faces a potential economic crisis. The island losing as much as $11 million a day in revenue as some of the usually packed hotels are turned into shelters. According to Governor Josh Green, more than 7,000 fire survivors are currently staying in 32 hotels across West Maui. But now next month, the state plans to relocate those residents as the hotels reopen for tourists. So for us, we're staying at the, at the hotel. It's like, okay, where are we going to go? Rick Nava, who lost his home to the fire, is among those now living in a hotel. While he does want the island to reopen for tourism, he says he's concerned about where he'll be living once they do. It seems the big question people have is where are we going to go? Yes. Can you imagine if you're staying at the hotel not knowing where you're going to go and suddenly there's a good possibility that, you know, on October 8th, before that, you will be displaced. The governor says no fire victim will be kicked out of a hotel without a new place to go, including longer term rentals like an Airbnb. We're going to negotiate a very good rate, over 100 percent of the baseline rate that people would get from a rental and we'll keep some hotels because we want to have a cushion so that no one becomes homeless. The state says if hotels remain closed, thousands in the tourism industry could lose their jobs. For people watching from the mainland, what do you want them to know right now? Please come to Maui. <laughs> the Lahaina has been destroyed, but the spirit of the people, the Aloha spirit, is there. So, yeah, please, <laughs> come and see us. 
Oh, God, such a difficult topic, obviously so emotional for the people of Maui. Our thanks to Liz for that report. Tourists should know that much of the island is open. Wailea in the south, where most resorts are located, remains open. And despite concerns from some residents, many say, as that piece described, that their livelihoods depend on those tourists coming back. Now to some financial news. Retirees could be getting some bigger checks in the mail come 2024. CNBC Silvana Hanau has that and some other financial news. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning to you. Yeah, so Social Security recipients could get a bit more money in their check next year, but public advocates say they'll still fall short of what they need. The Senior Citizens League estimates the cost of living adjustment will be 3.2 percent. Now, that would add just under $60 to monthly benefits, raising them to about $1,800 on average. But the group says the cost of goods and services for retirees is rising faster than benefits are. The cost of living adjustment is calculated based on an average of inflation readings for the months of July, August, and September. Caesars reportedly paid millions of dollars in ransom after the casino operator was hit by a cyber attack last month. The news comes as MGM Resorts continues to deal with a cybersecurity issue that was first reported this past weekend, forcing many of its systems to be shut down, including credit card transactions, digital room keys, and slot machines. Reports say the hacking group known as Scattered Spider was responsible for the Caesars attack, and the company paid roughly half the third. $30 million in ransom the group demanded. Google is updating Android Auto and software for vehicles equipped with Google integration. Drivers will now be able to join WebEx or Zoom meetings. The apps will work in audio-only format to make it easy and safe for drivers to join meetings from their car display. Google is also rolling out Prime Video on the Google Play app. It will only be available on a select number of brands, Renault, Polestar, and Volvo, and only when the car is parked, guys. Hmm. More ways to get out access to everyone. Yeah, exactly. Silvana, <laughs> thank you so much. You got it. NFL linebacker Carl Nassib broke barriers when he came out in 2021, becoming the NFL's first openly gay player to play in a regular season game. Now, just two years later, he says he's ready to retire. He made the announcement on Instagram last week, saying he'll now be focusing his time on his company, Rays, which connects volunteers with nonprofits. Carl Nassib joins us now. Carl, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. You are an inspiration to so many. We're going to talk about Rays in a moment but first I do want to ask you a few football questions including about of retirement uh, why did you decide now is the right time to step away from the NFL I know you've said football has given you more than you can ever imagine so I have to imagine this was an incredibly hard decision yeah it definitely wasn't easy um, football has been part of my life since I was a kid and a lot of players when they when they retire they have some thoughts they're you know, will I ever be good at anything else that like I was with football is like, have I peaked? But something I keep telling myself is like the best is yet to come. And so many more exciting things are ahead. And um, for me, um, I was a walk on. I never started in high school. Like I really, I really got good late. So I'm just so thankful for all the years that I got to play in the NFL at Penn State. And um, I'm really, really happy and proud of the career that I've uh, you know, strung together. As you should be. When people think of the NFL, the perception is, is that it's hyper-masculine to the point it could be toxic. So after you came out, just how were you received? I mean, without naming names, were there people who surprised you? Were there people who let you down? Yeah, I mean, as a whole, the reception was amazing. I mean, I've, I've said it so many times that, like, you know, NFL players and football players in general sometimes get... They get a bad reputation, but we're smart, intelligent, um, forward-thinking individuals. And, you know, that reflected the response that I got. The fans were amazing. Uh, the NFL was amazing. So I'm very, very, very lucky. I know other people haven't had the best experiences, so I do not take that for granted. I am thankful for everybody who has supported me, and I'm thankful for my family, friends. And I just try and do a little bit more so people can have positive experiences as well. There's no doubt you've paved the way for so many down the road. I'm guessing you hear often from athletes who are still in the closet wrestling with whether to come out. What's the biggest advice you give to them? Well, for anybody that's really um, deci like deciding their future that way, um, <clears throat> I always take it from the perspective of 
Don't, never be afraid to do what you want in life just because it might make your life just a little bit harder. Always achieve what you want for yourself and always work your hardest. I think that that message can translate into many different aspects, but um, that would be something that I would recommend that it's definitely worth it. At what point do you anticipate we will have several out LGBTQ plus athletes in the NFL, in pro sports, and it really won't be a huge deal? Are we just a couple of years away from that or could it be a little longer? You know, I don't have a crystal ball, um, but I just know that if they have the experience that I have, then they'll be in good shape. Which is so good to hear and I think comforting to so many. So now you say you're going to be spending your time focusing on your app, Rays. First and foremost, tell us about this. This sounds like such a great idea. Yeah, so what people are realizing more and more in this country is that there's a decrease in donors and a decrease in volunteers. Um, after COVID, America lost over 25% of its volunteers. And since 2000, um, it went from two thirds of America giving to charity. And now it's less than half of Americans are giving to charity. And nonprofits are feeling that, right? And so there are kind of a multitude of factors that contribute to that. One being less people are going to church, but less people really find or even approached by nonprofits because of this number one, this technological gap. You have these older nonprofits that are trying to connect with these young philanthropists. Gen Z and millennials are some of the most socially conscious individuals that have ever existed. So what Raise is trying to do is bridge that gap. And, you know, people have kind of referenced us as the LinkedIn of philanthropy. When you want to go find a job, you go to LinkedIn. When you want to find a place to get involved, you go to Raise. And what's really exciting right now is that users can donate to 1.8 million charities through Raise. And when it comes to tax season, they'll have all those receipts in the same place and they won't have to, you know, search through emails, search through paper receipts. And it's the most fiscally responsible way to give. So it's very, very exciting stuff. All right, Carl, uh, so good to have you on and talk about all these things, including this incredible effort you are focused on now that will make a difference for so many organizations Thanks. all around the country. We appreciate you and everything you've done, Carl Nassib. Have a great day. All right, coming up, he just broke the record for the most days in space. Yeah, this is so cool. Let me come back here from American astronaut Frank Rubio about the unplanned problem that led to his historic space flight. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. We want to welcome a new member to the Morning News Now family. Our technical production manager, Mike Cree, and his wife, Tori, have just welcomed their second child, Aaron Michael Cree, was born yesterday, weighing 7 pounds, 15 ounces, just under 8 pounds. Baby, mom, dad, and big sister are all doing well. Big congratulations. Yes, absolutely. Look how sweet the little hand is beautiful. Uh, congrats, Mike. Oh. Thanks, Joe. Well, NASA astronaut Frank Rubio is set to return to Earth at the end of this month after a record-breaking mission at the International Space Station. When he returns, he will have spent 371 days in space. That breaks the previous space flight record of 355 days. But his history-making space odyssey was not actually planned this way. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has the story. Astronaut Frank Rubio credits his children and his family as cornerstones for helping him to break a record 355 days in space, which is the single longest space flight in American history. And as it were, it happens by accident. And you see uh, Frank Rubio on the right. As far as records go. Having an opportunity uh, to say goodbye one final time. When American astronaut Frank Rubio set off on his mission to space last September, he wasn't planning on breaking any. And liftoff, a sunset start to the mission of Rubio. But a trip to the ISS, scheduled for six months, required an astronomical audible when the spacecraft sprang a leak. The trip now breaking an American record of 355 days. It was unexpected. In some ways, it's been uh, an incredible challenge, uh, but in other ways, it's been an incredible blessing. A new spacecraft won't return this crew until late September at the earliest, meaning not only have they counted off all the major holidays. A happy Thanksgiving. Happy holidays! But Rubio will become the first American in space for more than a calendar year. He exercises two hours a day, conducts experiments and video conferences with his family, but missed his now college-age son heading off to West Point. 
As much as it was a challenge for me as a father to miss all those things, it was also a pretty proud moment to see um, Deb and the kids just uh, thrive and overcome. From 250 miles above, Rubio has a message that still holds great gravity. There's very few things in life that we accomplish individually, and almost everything uh, big that we accomplish as humanity requires incredible teamwork. From Earth, Sam Brock, NBC News. <laughs> ah, from Earth, that was good. Oh, wow, can you imagine that? I can't, no, and I'm sure his family is thrilled, absolutely thrilled. Oh, and what, how, what, you know, how great his attitude is about the whole thing, just up there. Exactly. For so all right, much I'm here. Time. I mean, oh my gosh, it's crazy. It's a great opportunity. Very we all, cool, we yes. all are a little jealous. Yeah. All right, that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Good morning and thanks for joining us this Thursday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, killer in custody after a grueling nearly two week long manhunt. Authorities in Pennsylvania have finally captured escaped fugitive Danilo Cavalcante. We're going to hear from law enforcement on how exactly they caught him. Plus what Cavalcante's daring escape from jail might say about America's prison system in 2023. Also this morning, the clock is ticking toward a looming auto workers strike, one that could be detrimental to a pivotal American industry. Labor negotiations with the big three automakers are faltering, and both sides have until midnight to reach a deal or the picketing begins. More on the state of those negotiations this morning and how a possible strike could affect cars already on the road. Plus, so over the hill, Utah Senator Mitt Romney sending shockwaves announcing he won't run for re-election next year. We're going to take you behind that decision, plus his message to President Biden and former President Trump. And down, but not out, Jets QB Aaron Rodgers breaking his silence on that tragic season-ending injury earlier this week. That looks like he is leaving the door open to a comeback eventually so not hanging it up just yet even though he's about to turn 40. i know i know and just oh god what a story that that's been this week here exactly oh. we'll see we'll see what happens we're yes. going to begin in pennsylvania of course where the search for that escaped prisoner has now come to an end that's right danello cavalcante who was convicted of murdering his former girlfriend was captured and processed into police custody yesterday after an intense manhunt that lasted almost two weeks and this morning there are some new developments from authorities about how cavalcante was able to evade police and his plans to leave the country. NBC News correspondent George Solis has been following this story from the very beginning. He joins us again now from Pennsylvania with the latest. Hi, George, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah and Joe. It all unfolding in dramatic fashion in these woods right behind me. Now, a tactical team that was here had to wait out a storm before making their move. And when they did, Cavalcante did not go down without a fight, but in the end, authorities managed to get their man. This morning, after nearly two weeks on the run, convicted killer Daniello Cavalcante is finally back in custody. Our nightmare is finally over and the good guys won. Cavalcante managed to elude authorities for two weeks by slipping past perimeters, stealing a van, and even using a razor he found in a stolen bag to shave off his beard in an attempt to disguise his appearance. You know, I, I don't know that he was particularly skilled. He was desperate, and I've said that all along. And now we're learning how Cavalcante managed to stay one step ahead. U.S. Marshal Robert Clark was part of the task force tracking Cavalcante. Uh, he uh, a watermelon. He found a watermelon on a farm uh, early in uh, in his flight. He drank water from the stream. Authorities say they used the element of surprise to zero in on their target. Overnight, a DEA aircraft with thermal imaging picked up a heat source, but was forced to leave the area because of severe weather. Tactical teams eventually able to move in. Cavalcante did not realize he was surrounded until that had occurred. That did not stop him from trying to escape. When he tried to flee, a canine named Yoda by Customs and Border Protection took him down. Officers on the scene posing for this picture with a handcuffed Cavalcante. They're proud of their work. They're not doing anything to demean him or uh, uh, harm him in any way there. A chief Border Patrol agent posting additional photos online. Officers also recovering the rifle Cavalcante stole from a home earlier this week. Officials say Cavalcante planned to use the weapon to steal another vehicle. The family of Deborah Brandau, the ex-girlfriend Cavalcante was convicted of murdering, releasing a statement saying they're deeply grateful for the support and hard work by authorities. Also grateful, this community, once gripped with fear, 
now finally able to exhale. I am super relieved, super, super glad that it's over. Yeah, major relief here in this community. And this morning, Cavalcante is waking up inside a maximum security prison in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. But where he will ultimately end up to finish carrying out the remainder of his life sentence is still being decided. Joe and Savannah. All right, George, thank you so much. And we're hearing more about the inmate capture from Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro and State Police Colonel Christopher Paris. They joined the Today Show this morning to discuss the search and the moments following Cavalcante's arrest. When did spirits dip the most? I don't know that the spirits actually dip. There are highs and lows in an investigation like this. The resolve was constantly there, not only within the ranks of the state police, but also with our federal and local partners. And we knew that he was desperate. We knew that he was looking, or he was where we were looking, and we needed to just press the incident through to its conclusion. And do you agree, Colonel, that he was getting ready to flee the country? Our concern always was the threat to public safety, and we're indebted to the people of Chester County. He had a weapon. It was a weapon that could have certainly hurt law enforcement, but more importantly than that, it could have hurt um, members of the public. So a desperate person on the run with nothing to lose, facing life without parole, that was our chief concern. Uh, we wanted to find him wherever we could. Colonel, how, how, what do you think about this photo op with some members of the team posing with the suspect moments after his capture? How does that sit with you? Is that appropriate? Thank you for the question. Uh, I believe that you have to put it in proper context that these tactical operators surrounded him and sat through a lightning and thunderstorm through the evening when we lost the aerial overwatch. And this was an individual who was crawling towards a weapon, which he stole. And the professional restraint that they showed and being able to take him uh, alive and in relatively uh, good health, we're very proud of that professionalism. Governor, how about you? Look, I, I'm proud of them, and they're proud of their work. I think it's important that we acknowledge that for 14 days, law enforcement from every level left their homes, left their loved ones, and they put their lives at risk. So, man, I think it's important uh, for everybody to understand that the gun that Cavalcante had literally was capable of piercing the bulletproof vest that they were wearing. They put their lives at risk every day. Uh, they were proud of their work, and I'm incredibly proud of them. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas for more on this. Danny, always great to have you with us. So look, he's already serving this life sentence for murdering his ex-girlfriend, also wanted for an alleged murder in Brazil. What does this kind of add to that? The fact that he escaped, evaded them for two weeks. What happens next? He's already serving a life sentence here in this particular jurisdiction. He'll be charged with escape, assuming he's convicted. If he is, uh, he will have another sentence added on to the one that he has, but he'll probably be reclassified. If he wasn't already at the highest security level, he might be reclassified. I would imagine they would transfer him out of Chester County Prison and maybe to another maximum security, maybe SCI Muncie. I don't know. I practice in Philadelphia and the surrounding counties, including Chester County. Uh, I don't know whether they'll send him back for classification, but the bottom line is this. He's already serving a life sentence, and then even if he somehow got out, in all likelihood what's supposed to happen is he would be removed from the United States, sent back down to Brazil for prosecution there. But the, the scary reality is a lot of times, uh, probably with a prisoner like this, they would come get him, but the federal authorities don't always come pick up uh, someone on their state release and initiate removal proceedings. Could we expect any sort of investigation into the county jail here? And is it possible anyone there could face any sort yeah. of charges? Uh, Joe, you're going to get me in trouble here because, <laughs> look, I practice in Pennsylvania. There will be an investigation. It will reach the same conclusion that all of these investigations do, which is the prison will say we're underfunded, we're understaffed, we're overcrowded, everyone will shrug, and they'll go back to whatever they were doing. I just wrote a column about this on msnbc.com. Uh, prisons are the one industry that we have, not only do we have low expectations, that's sort of the standard, because it's prison. Hey, do you got bed bugs? Well, it's not the Ritz-Carlton. It's prison. This is what you should expect. The problem with that is when low expectations are part of the culture, then low expectations uh, become part of the security, and then we shouldn't be surprised when some, someone shimmies up a wall that apparently, reportedly, someone already shimmied up before and got out to the outside. How do we fix that? 
How do we fix it? Well, it's a conversation people don't want to have, which is nobody wants to run on a platform of let's give more money to the prisons and make them more secure. But the bottom line is prison culture is that it's not built for customer service. It's not supposed to work. It's built for inefficiency. Uh, so for that reason, we shouldn't be that surprised when systems fail and people get out. All right. Danny Savalos, as always, thank you so much. This morning, the auto industry is speeding toward a midnight deadline. We could see nearly 150,000 union workers walking off the job, putting the brakes on auto production across the country. The United Auto Workers Union is negotiating with the big three car companies on a new contract. So far, no deal has been reached. For more, we're joined by NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch, who is at the Detroit Auto Show. Jesse, the clock is ticking. Yeah, Joe, we're inside of 18 hours now, so uh, little time left to reach a deal. Both sides still bargaining as far as we know. But as you mentioned, if we don't see new deals before midnight, we are expecting the UAW to strike against all three of the big three automakers. The union says this would be historic, the first time it has struck against all three of these companies at the same time. There are implications, of course, for tens of thousands of jobs. But if you at home are considering buying a new car, that could get trickier. And if you have a car right now but need a repair, that could be more complicated, too. In Motor City and beyond, this morning, the drumbeat of a potential United Auto Workers strike is growing louder, and the clock is quickly running out. We're willing to do what's necessary to win justice by any means necessary. The UAW's demands for Detroit's big three automakers include a 46% pay raise compounded over four years. But according to the union, GM, Ford and Stellantis are only offering between 17 and 20% raises over four and a half years. Mighty, mighty union. And without new deals before midnight, the union says workers will walk off the job at all three companies. You prepare to go on strike. Absolutely. What do we got to do, you know, to, to, to protect me, to protect my job, to protect my future? Already, the union collecting donated food and toiletries, a reminder that if they go on strike, some workers may struggle to even pay for the basic things we all need at home. But instead of having all of its roughly 146,000 big three workers walk out at once, the union is planning to only strike at specific facilities. The impact could be just as great as if you shut down the entire company. Because if there are no engines, no transmissions, that essentially shuts down final assembly. In statements, Stellantis and GM both emphasizing good faith negotiations. Sure hard to negotiate a contract when there's no one to negotiate with. Ford's CEO and the UAW's president trading barbs, including over what Ford is offering for workers' pay. I, I don't know what to say other than we have put great offers in front of the UAW and we're waiting for the response. The looming strike could be tough for car buyers with the potential to limit choices on car lots nationwide. Repairs could get tricky too. If I can't get the parts to fix your car, that's going to be a huge problem. GM and Stellantis are talking about good faith bargaining. Ford says its team has been sleeping at company headquarters to get the job done. But the union is accusing these companies of negotiating in bad faith with insulting offers being made to the union workers. If the union does go on strike, it's unclear how long this could last. Because of this strike strategy, what they're calling a stand-up strike, we are expecting the union to have the strike strategy evolve. And because not all of the workers will be on strike at once, the strike pay funding that the union has could last longer, and that could drag out a strike. So, Joe, we are going to be watching very closely what happens in the hours ahead. But again, at this point, there still appears to be an impasse, still appears to be a gap between what the union is demanding and what the companies are willing to offer. And it's looking like we are heading toward that strike at midnight. All Joe? Right. Jesse, thank you so much. Well, in Washington this morning, Congress is preparing for a changing of the guard after Utah's Republican Senator Mitt Romney announced yesterday that he won't be seeking re-election next year. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us now on this. Hey, Ryan, great to see you. What do we know so far about the reasons behind Romney's decision? Savannah, it appears there are many reasons why Mitt Romney decided that this was the time for him to step aside, but perhaps the most important reason to him was that he's 76 years old and he did not want to be serving in a position as important as the United States Senate into his 80s. And it comes at a time 
where there are a number of questions about aging politicians, not only in the Congress, but in the White House as well. Listen to Romney talk about age as an issue and why he believes it's time for a new generation of leadership. I've spent my last 25 years in public service of one kind or another. At the end of another term, I'd be in my mid-80s. Frankly, it's time for a new generation of leaders. They're the ones that need to make the decisions that will shape the world they will be living in. And Romney basically saying that the decisions that are being made in the Senate right now in the long term won't really impact the people that are in that building. And it's time for young people to be a part of this conversation. And he said that it applies not only to him, but for the two primary people running for president of the United States right now, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. He believes both of them should step aside as well to allow this new generation to take over. Savannah. Ryan, what have we heard from others? What's the reaction from fellow lawmakers to all this? Well, Donald Trump is happy to see Mitt Romney go. There's no doubt about that. And because uh, Mitt Romney's been such a harsh critic of Donald Trump, and he's also revealing a lot about what other people think about uh, Mitt Romney from behind the scenes. But his colleagues in the Senate, uh, by and large, are going to be sad to see him go. Listen to what some of them uh, said yesterday, including John Cornyn, who is one of the leading Republicans. I'm sorry he's not running. He's a, a great American and uh, been an outstanding senator. And uh, but. This is always an individual choice, and we wish him the best. It's good to have new, uh, new, new blood every t now and then, but it's also good to have experienced hands like uh, Senator Romney. And we also heard from Democrats as well saying that they're going to be sad to see Mitt Romney go, including the current Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who said that Romney was always someone that they could work with on issues where they had common ideals. Ryan, finally, I mean, this announcement's coming actually as this is kind of part of the conversation anyway because of this biography that's coming mm -hmm. out about Romney. Tell us some excerpts. I know we got a little bit in the Atlantic recently. What are we learning here? Yeah, this really has the potential to be an explosive book. Uh, McKay Coppins, who is a longtime follower of Mitt Romney, uh, was given extraordinary access to the senator. Uh, they did countless interviews that stretched for hours at a time, and he was also given access to all kinds of material uh, in Romney's uh, library, his emails, his journals. Uh, and he has a lot of insight into the behind-the-scenes conversations that Romney had with his colleagues, particularly as it relates to Donald Trump. And according to the Coppins book, an excerpt, of which uh, has been released in The Atlantic. Uh, Romney said that behind the scenes, his Republican colleagues shared the similar disdain that he had for Donald Trump, did not believe that he should be the leader of the party, but mm. they felt that they couldn't say that publicly because of the stranglehold that he had on the Republican Party. So this is just the beginning uh, yeah. of what we're going to learn from this book, which is, is scheduled to come out at the end of October. So there you go. Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. Now to a ruling with major implications out of Texas. That's where a federal judge has ruled the revised DACA program is illegal. DACA, or the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, protects hundreds of thousands of undocumented people who were brought to the U.S. as children from being deported. The Biden administration is expected to fight this decision, which could end up in front of the Supreme Court. We will stay on top of the story and bring you the latest as it develops. All right, we are keeping a close eye still on Hurricane Lee as the coast of New England braces for heavy rain and strong winds from this slow-moving storm. Let's get a check on your morning news now forecast. Meteorologist Angie Lassman joins us. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Hurricane Lee, the thing that we will all be watching here as we get through at least the weekend, this system now impacting parts of Bermuda, leaving them with tropical storms conditions at this hour still remains a hurricane cat two level strength 100 mile per hour winds and moving north now at 12 miles per hour so as expected the system's going to pick up a little speed thankfully as it makes its way to the north through those colder waters dealing with a little bit of shear it is likely to weaken but we're still going to see impacts for folks in new england and parts of atlantic canada here's those latest alerts we've got the hurricane watch issued from eastport down through portland we've got the tropical storm watches of course from maine through rhode island these are going to stay up for a little while longer before they'll likely be turned over into warnings as we get closer say 24 hours before impact we usually see the hurricane warnings uh, go into effect the coastal impacts farther south are going to remain to be the rip current risk the elevated surf the coastal erosion you'll see a lot of that up and down the southeast coast over the next couple of days and it's still going to remain difficult to be swimming here uh, for the extended period even into the weekend we could see some issues with that up and down the east coast here's the latest track we're going to see this system continue to weaken expected to be a 
Hat one by the time we get into maybe later today or even early tomorrow as it moves just west of Bermuda. Notice they don't get into the hurricane force winds, but they're definitely into those tropical storm force winds, which extend well from the center. This is one of the things with this system that's been really impressive, just how massive it has become and how massive it will continue to get here as it nears parts of New England and eventually making landfall in Canada. That is where we're expecting maybe parts of down east Maine. I, I mean, I, it, either way, it's still in the cone, but the impacts are going to remain really unchanged no matter where it makes landfall. We'll still see the strong winds. We'll see the storm surge be an issue. And you can see just how far from the center those, those stronger winds extend. This is, will be something that likely will knock out power. We'll see some down trees. Even if you're looking inland and you say places like Concord, we'll still see some heavy rain in that area. So really saturated soil. It isn't going to take much for some trees to come down with winds 30, 40 miles per hour. So just a heads up there, but of course along the coast, much stronger winds, Nantucket, 70 mile per hour, peak oh. wind gusts. You know, you look up to Bar Harbor, guys, and it's low 60s. Either way, the winds are going to be an issue for this region, even far from the center of where it eventually comes on shore. But we also have to watch for that storm surge. This will be an issue with this system. It is massive. With that, of course, in size comes a whole lot of water pushing up towards the coast. We know with Dahlia, the high tide time was an mm -hmm. issue. This will be something that we'll have to watch for in Cape Cod Bay as well. Oof. All right, Angie, thank you so much. Chris. Well, coming up on Morning News Now, sideline Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers now breaking his silence on the tragic injury that put his season to rest. We've got a social media message to fans after this. Welcome back. This morning, there are growing concerns about a stranded cruise ship which ran to ground in Greenland on Monday. Multiple attempts to free the ocean explorer vessel have so far failed. The luxury liner has 206 people on board. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea joins us with more on this. Kelly, good morning. Joe, good morning to you. A Danish Navy ship is now on its way to the remote Arctic coastline of Greenland, but is still at least a day away, with more than 200 people trapped on board, at least three of them infected with COVID. This morning, the Danish cruise ship Ocean Explorer, waiting for help for a fourth day off the beautiful but frigid coast of Greenland, with 206 passengers and crew stranded on board. Overnight, the cruise company Aurora Expeditions, confirming three of the passengers have COVID-19, are in isolation and are doing well. The ship, on a luxury cruise to the Arctic, ran aground Monday during low tide. The crew reportedly dropping anchor and floating lifeboats to lighten the load. One attempt to tow the ship has failed. The Danish Navy believes it's likely wedged in thick mud and sand. Luckily, it's not a rock. That could have caused greater damage, this Navy commander says, adding, because it's on a soft bed, it's stuck and will be more difficult to get free. The closest Danish Navy ship, more than 1,300 miles away, now coming to the rescue. On their website, Aurora says they offer life-changing expeditions to some of the most remote and unspoiled destinations on our planet. Passengers paying thousands for stunning views of the glaciers in Northeast Greenland National Park, known for its spectacular icebergs. Among them, Australians Gina Hill and Stephen Fraser, according to the Sydney Morning Herald. Fraser says he and several others contracted COVID, adding there's a doctor on board and also saying, it's a little bit frustrating, but we're in a beautiful part of the world. We're sitting right near the glacier when we open our window. Their adventure of a lifetime on hold for now. The crew has tried refloating several times at high tide, but that hasn't worked. A surveillance plane has flown over the ship to try to formulate some sort of plan to free it. The military ship, when it arrives, may try towing the cruise liner off the mud. And another cruise ship in the area has been asked to stick around in case it's needed. But this morning, the Danish military says that they've been on board, they've checked on the passengers, and both they and the cruise company say no one is in any danger. Joe? All right, quite the voyage. Mm -hmm. Kelly, thank you so much. Now to the latest on NFL quarterback Aaron Rodgers' season-ending injury. Less than 48 hours after tearing his Achilles tendon, the future Hall of Famer is speaking out while the Players Union is calling on the NFL to ban artificial turf. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now with more from his 
from him and also how the league is reacting to this union's call to ban that turf. Hey, Steph, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Aaron Rodgers is looking at surgery and months of rehab. Well, Jets fans are still trying to come to terms with his injury and their dashed hopes. In his first comments since being carted off the field Monday night, Rodgers says he is heartbroken but determined to come back. 48 hours after the stunning Achilles injury that knocked four-time NFL MVP Aaron Rodgers out of the game and ended his season, the 39-year-old superstar writing on Instagram, I'm completely heartbroken and moving through all of the emotions, but deeply touched and humbled by the support and love, adding, the night is darkest before the dawn and I shall rise yet again. Rodgers' injury shocked the sports world, coming just four plays into the QB's debut with the New York Jets after a high-profile move to New York from Green Bay and a contract that includes a guaranteed $75 million. Despite Rodgers' promise of a comeback, Jets fans devastated, even though he may end up helping on the sidelines. He's as much a football coach as he is a player, and um, just having his presence, I think anybody would, would want that. The season-ending injury is reigniting controversy over turf. MetLife Stadium just installed a new artificial turf field this year. The NFL Players Association re-upping its call to put in grass in every NFL stadium. Moving all stadium fields to high-quality natural grass surfaces is the easiest decision the NFL can make, the union writes. The players overwhelmingly prefer it, and the data is clear that grass is simply safer than artificial turf. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell responding to the union's request on ESPN's first take. What we're looking, we have engineers to look at that. We'll look at the mechanism of injury on Aaron's injury. But unfortunately, we had, a, we had two ACL injuries uh, on and one was on grass and okay. one was on the turf. The Jets head coach pointing out that Rogers' injury may not be relevant to the debate. You know, if it was a non-contact injury, uh, I think I think that'd be something to, to discuss, obviously. But uh, it was, that was kind of a forcible, uh, I think that was trauma-induced. This debate over turf has been going on for a while. The union says there is data to show there are more non-contact injuries on an artificial surface. But the league argues that in recent years, that has not been the case. The Jets will be playing on turf again this week in Dallas against the Red Hot Cowboys. Guys, they just shut out the New York Giants 40 to nothing. Oof. So, uh, you know, Whoa. New York City football fans are bracing for another tough the, weekend. The, well, or the Jets have another test in front of them Ooh, here. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Stephanie, thank you so much. You're welcome. International headlines now starting with the latest out of Morocco, where rescue efforts are still underway nearly one week after that massive, deadly earthquake. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavango is back with that and more. Hey, Claudio. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Joel. That's right. It has almost been a week now since that 6.8 magnitude quake struck uh, Morocco. And you can see now that hotel owner uh, looking out at the distraction is one of uh, many business owners and community uh, members who now have to rebuild. Now, aid hubs operations are uh, underway in a town near the epicenter. They're distributing water and supplies to the estimated 300,000 affected people whose communities are now destroyed. Rescue, rescue operations continue with search teams from Britain, Spain and Qatar aiding the Moroccan military, but hope is now fading. Let's fly over to China. The country just unveiled a plan to deepen integration with the coastal province of Fujian and Taiwan. They are also sending warships around the island to show their military might. State media say this new document is the, quote, blueprint of Taiwan's future development. The documents say China hopes Fujian will become the, quote, first home for Taiwanese residents and businesses to settle in China, a delicate moment as tensions increase between the countries. We end our tour in Switzerland, where a 2,000-year-old ancient Roman stone wall was unearthed. Researchers are calling it an archaeological sensation. The Office Pro for Preservation of Monuments and Archaeology say the wall was once part of an entire building complex with multiple rooms. Researchers are hoping this big find will provide some insights into Romans, the Romans and their impact uh, as far as Switzerland. Wow. Guys. All right, walls can be exciting. All right, Claudia. There you go. <laughs> thank you so much. Coming up, the latest round of COVID boosters and you. We've got all you need to know about the new shots, like who should get them and how do they differ from the other rounds of boosters. But first, a massive investment in cancer research that's just been announced by the White House. We've got more on that next on Morning News Now.
We're back with new details about a major undertaking by the White House to re-energize the fight against cancer. Yesterday, President Biden pledged $240 million, called on agencies to work together to cut the cancer death rate in half by 2047. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us now with more on this. Peter, good morning. So before we get to the details about the cancer initiative, I do first want to ask you about this impeachment inquiry. Last yeah. night, President Biden did talk about it publicly for the first time. What did he say? Yeah, Joe, the president and I think the White House largely have gone to great lengths to try to steer clear of engaging this. Uh, we have heard from the White House counsel's office obviously pushing back. They say it's illegitimate, that it is all a political stunt. They have said repeatedly that President Biden did nothing wrong here. But the president, I think we should say himself, has steered clear until last night when he was at a private fundraiser in Virginia. And he did speak about it, saying, the best I can tell, they, referring to the House Republicans, want to impeach me because they want to shut down the government. He said, among other things, I get up every day. I got a job to do. I've got to deal with the issue that affect the American people every single day. This White House has been ramping up in anticipation of this and uh, impeachment inquiry that was announced unilaterally, that declaration coming from Kevin McCarthy, even though 12 days earlier McCarthy said he would have uh, had a vote before he would make any such decision. The White House has put together a war room, Joe, with uh, a couple dozen lawyers, communications staffers, and legislative aides as well, anticipating that this could be something that takes place over the course of the next month or perhaps much longer. All right, Peter, let's turn to the president's announcement on cancer. This is obviously a deeply personal issue for the president. So what more should we know about this $240 million and, and how researchers will benefit from it? Well, as you know, this is a personal priority of President Biden and his wife, the first lady, after they lost their son, Beau, to brain cancer in 2015. It did start under President Obama, but they revamped it last year to, to really emphasize cutting cancer deaths in half by 2047, as you noted. It'll focus, as the screen showed on earlier detection, increased treatment efficiency, and also bringing in all branches of government here. And notably, the president uh, said yesterday that that will include NASA, the Department of Defense. NASA will be involved as well here. He said that they have an expertise in radiation and hope that's an example of ways that those at NASA can help better address the issues related to cancer in this country and around the globe. Fitting, you could say, considering this has been dubbed the cancer moonshot. So the program yeah. goes beyond funding research. What are some other parts of the initiative we should know about, Peter? Well, among the priorities, obviously, they will be trying to focus on ceasing the cessation of smoking. And, and the president has, has made an effort here now as part of a deal, and I want to make sure we get this right. The National Cancer Institute is going to be working with the Indian Health Service and other partners in what they call smoke-free native. This is described as a text messaging program to help those, particularly in the Native American community, to try to wean themselves off of smoking while acknowledging, it says, the significance of traditional tobacco. Separately, there's going to be a heavy focus on veterans, the veteran community, with the VA getting involved here to better engage veterans in efforts to stop the use of tobacco as well. Joe. All right, Peter Alexander, a lot to cover from the White House this morning. Thank you so much. Turning now to the coronavirus pandemic, as the new COVID shots have now received the green light by both the CDC and FDA, and now they might be on their way to a pharmacy near you. That's right. This latest round of boosters have been recommended for anyone over the age of six months, and the CDC is now urging people to get this latest jab as COVID cases rise across the country. NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sahil joins us now from one of these pharmacies where you can soon receive this shot. Dr. Sahil, great to see you. Um, I guess kind of two questions here for you. I, I think uh, we keep talking about this as a booster. Does the kind of the mindset need to change about this just being something you get every year? And how do these new COVID shots differ from the last ones? Good morning, guys. Yeah, we're here at a CVS in Midtown, New York, where some of the first people in the country actually got that updated vaccine that you're talking about, Savannah. And, and yeah, to answer your question, we're looking to turn this updated COVID vaccine and sort of the thought process behind this into what we see with the flu, uh, Savannah. And so that really comes down to, you know, having an annual vaccine uh, once a year that really matches the current strains. And uh, Savannah, the reason that, uh, you know, health officials are saying this is so necessary is because our vaccines that we had before aren't really matching the current variants that we see. 
Um, so with this updated vaccine, we're really hoping to bolster that protection against the current variants and really keep people out of the hospital, Savannah. Mm. So Dr. Sayal, there has been some pushback against the new COVID shots by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who's also running for president. He's now advising Floridians 65 and under not to get them, saying in a statement, quote, I will not stand by and let the FDA and CDC use healthy Floridians as guinea pigs mm. for new booster shots that have not been proven to be safe or effective. Um, what should people know that we know there are people who have questioned whether these vaccines are safe? This is politics from Governor DeSantis. But for those who do have legitimate questions, what's your advice to those who might be opposed to getting the shot? Hey, Joe, yeah, you know, my advice to those who may be opposed to getting the shot, it really comes down to your risk profile, meaning that are you somebody, if you are under the age of 65, are you somebody who has a lot of uh, chronic health conditions? Are you somebody who has diabetes? Are you somebody who's suffering from obesity? Um, if you are somebody who's under the age of 65 and you have those things, I would really strongly urge you to consider getting this vaccine. And I think that's my big problem with uh, the Florida statement, uh, Joe, is that, you know, it, it looks at a blanket statement for those under 65, really not considering people at an individual level, those who may have certain risk factors, those who, those may who you know, be living with somebody who has certain risk factors. Um, so that's really where my advice comes in, Joe. And Dr. Sal, I know you spoke to some patients who've received this vaccine. What'd they say? Yeah, Savannah, we wanted to be out here and, and really hear from people who are the first in line to get this shot. Uh, take a listen to some, some patients here at, at CVS and, and, and hear why they wanted to get the vaccine in the first place. I'm traveling next week to Japan and I'm going to be surrounded by a lot of people, so I just want to make sure I'm safe. Um, also, I have a number of friends who are actually down with COVID right now, so I think it's important for me to stay safe, you know, get, you know, the vaccine. My primary motivation is I don't want to get my family sick, and that's my primary concern. And then also uh, people around me, my friends. For those who are wondering when they can get the shot, many pharmacies are offering it today, but most should have it within the next seven days. And guys, you really want to aim to get both the COVID vaccine and the flu vaccine before Halloween. All right. Good reminder there, Dr. Akshay Sal. Thank you so much. Well, coming up, the latest in installment in our ongoing series, Women Mean Business. After the break, we'll introduce you to a celebrity stylist who has worked with some of the biggest names in the business. But now she's focusing her efforts on encouraging women to embrace something else. Her name is Carla Welch, and she joins us next right here in our studio. That's coming up next. We are back with some money news, and it's looking like big chip maker Arm is set to go public today. CNBC Savannah Hanau has that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning. Yes, yeah, so the IPO market is showing some signs of life. Chipmaker Arm Holdings is going public today after pricing its offering at the high end of Wall Street's estimates and following heavy interest by some major investors, including Apple and Google. The IPO will value Arm at more than $50 billion, making it the largest offering since electric vehicle maker Rivian went public two years ago. Arm, which designs chips that are used in a majority of the world's smartphones, will trade on the NASDAQ. Delta Airlines will restrict access to its SkyClub airport lounges as it tries to cut down on overcrowding. Starting in 2025, American Express Platinum cardholders will be allowed six visits per year, and Delta Reserve Amex cardholders will get 10 visits. Passengers who book a basic economy ticket will no longer be allowed in the lounges starting this January, regardless of what premium credit card they have. TikTok has been quietly inserting Wikipedia entries into some search results for people, places, and events. TechCrunch reports it found links in results for items such as the New York Times, Taylor Swift, and Thanksgiving. A TikTok spokesperson confirming to The Verge it's partnered with Wikipedia to bring information to users within the app, and the feature has been live for a few months. Clicking on the snippet will take you directly to Wikipedia, guys. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. Savannah. Well, now to the latest edition in our series, Women Mean Business. Carla Welch is a celebrity stylist who is on a mission to encourage women to embrace their monthly cycle. She's doing it through her business, The Period Company. Here's more on her work. After growing up working in her dad's menswear store, Carla Welch considered a career in food, but plumped for fashion. 
She built a career as a celebrity stylist, putting together the hottest looks for some of the biggest names in Hollywood, like Tracy Ellis Ross, Justin Bieber, Olivia Wilde, and Sarah Paulson. But her family life gave her a new purpose. When her child's period came at age 10, she recalled her own negative feelings around her period and knew she had to do something to change the narrative. And in 2020, the period company was born. The company has developed a sustainable, low-cost underwear people can use instead of traditional feminine products and the waste that comes with them. Sales have continued to grow, and now even Walmart stocks them. Welch hopes she can help empower her customers to embrace their period, opening the door for conversation on a topic that was once taboo. Carla Welch is a woman who means business. Carla Welch, of course, joins us now, CEO, founder of The Period Company. Carla, thank you so much for being here. This is so much fun. Thank you for having me. So I actually just said in that piece there, at the very end, it said this topic that used to be taboo, but the truth is it totally still is. I mean, it's this shameful, secretive thing, not necessarily something we're comfortable, especially not talking about on TV. You've said before (laughs) that you want to restart this conversation. Let's do it now. What does that mean? Well, I think it means for us to reimagine how we feel about our periods, right? We've been told since the beginning of our periods, since the beginning of our mother's periods and grandma's periods, that there's something to hide and that they're shameful. And you know, we know what that's a product of, of course, but now it's time to like imagine and step into the idea of maybe having a relationship with your period because it's, it's powerful. It's telling us about our health every month. It's it's a life force. Like, why are we treating periods and the people who have them like they're not important? Mm, you've even called it, think of it as a superpower. It is a superpower. What do you mean when you say that? Well, first of all, it can give life if you choose to or not. But, but again, it's something that, you know, people who period are formidable. There are 80 million people on the planet right now having a period. And if we could step into the value of it in, instead of being ashamed of it, mm. like, it doesn't just, you know, it it doesn't stop with the period. It's self-confidence. It's staying in school. It's uplifting half the population, you know. Mm. What happens when we have shame about our periods? It, it takes you out of the game a little bit, right? Mm. Like, I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have access to period products. Absolutely. You know, so it, it's like a reimagination. Speaking of products, mm-hmm. let's get into your company. Yeah, let's get into it. So how did you even come up with this idea? What was it that made you want to start this? So... Pure necessity. My child got their period really early, mm. and it was a disaster. And I realized, oh my gosh, I'm doing what my mom did. I'm not giving like the proper period talk. I'm not prepared. Mm. And I, I think that's pretty normal. I, most people I talk to are like, oh yeah, I never had that conversation. But what I needed was something to take care of my child's period. And, and period underwear was in the marketplace. You know, it wasn't this brand new idea that we came up with, but. At the time, it was really, really expensive, and I didn't think it was an amazing product. It was like a good backup plan, you mm. know, when your tampon leaks, because <laughs> your tampon has leaked right. many, many of times. So it was there to catch it, but I needed something that my kid could put on and go to school and get through their day and not have to think about it, you know, not have to be worried. Like, a child isn't a woman because they get their period and an adult all of a sudden. They were still a kid that need it to mm. get through their school day. So I just kind mm. of, I had you know a lot of experience in manufacturing and in design. I thought I'm gonna make the most affordable, safe, absorbent period underwear. And I'm gonna make it accessible for everyone because people shouldn't be priced out of care that half of us need. And in terms of everyone, you're even in Walmart now. Yes. I mean, how cool Yay. is that? It doesn't get more mainstream. That was our big goal, you know, we wanted to reach everyone and we knew that the biggest retailer mm. in the world was the place to do it. Absolutely. Before we let you go, we of course have to talk about your iconic stylist career. Yay. Something so many people want to do, look up to do, but just what is it that you love about that job? Who's fun to style? Tell us a little bit about that world. Oh, it's incredible. You know, I feel fortunate that I've had an amazing career for 20 years and wonderful clients who I adore. You know, I like everybody I style. I, I mean, I love seeing the pictures of Justin because it's mm-hmm. always fun. Um, Eber, by the way. Eber, <laughs> my guy. Um, no, it's it's wonderful. I love clothes. I love designers. I love helping people feel good. And 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 it's 
all brought me to the place of the periods too, right? Yeah. It's not, it's being of service to people. Absolutely. And um, yeah, that's what yeah. I love. We've only got like 30 seconds left, okay. but in this segment, we always love to ask, what's one piece of advice you would give a young person who's looking at your path, who wants to hear from you on that? Multi, like being a multi, uh, having multitudes, sorry. Oh, please. Is, um, is important. You know, you could look at my life of going to college and kind of dropping out of college and then mm. going into the food industry and being in retail and then jumping to styling and then periods and not see a connection. But everything has gotten me to where I am today. Hmm. So I think to young people, you know, don't be so stressed out about school. Mm -hmm. Don't be so stressed out about oh, what, God. where you're going I to because, hear that then. because it's all a process and everything right. I learned 20 years ago, I'm applying today. Oh, Carla Welch, thank you. Great thank conversation you. to have and put it on TV and get it out there. So great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, coming up amid Hollywood standstill, some talk shows like Real Time with Bill Maher and The Drew Barrymore Show are now returning to the airwaves, and that's not without some controversy. Yeah, we've got some more on the backlash some daytime hosts are facing from the picket lines and what your fall TV lineup might look like. That's next. Welcome back. As the Hollywood strikes continue, some big names are pitching in to help behind the scenes workers affected. An auction page has been set up on eBay to benefit the Union Solidarity Coalition's Crew Healthcare Fund. Here's some of what's on there. Actress Natasha Leone will help with solving a crossword puzzle. The cast of Bob's Burgers will write and sing a song for you. And Girls creator Lena Dunham will paint a mural in your house if you have a dog. Third Rock from the Sun star John Lithgow will paint its portrait. <laughs> Parks and Recreation's Adam Scott will take it for a walk. The auctions are currently open but closed on September 27th. Pretty epic stuff there. Yeah, those are some fun ideas. I, I would definitely want to do a crossword puzzle with Natasha Lee. I feel like that would be like, <laughs> oh, awesome. all right. Yeah. Thanks, Savannah. Yeah. Finally this hour, the growing cost of that Hollywood strike. It's not only impacting tens of thousands of jobs, it's also delaying the shows and movies that were scheduled for this fall. NBC News Entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas has the latest. Hey there, no question the strikes are wreaking havoc in Hollywood. Experts say it's costing the industry an estimated $3 billion with little movement in negotiations. Production on many blockbuster films has completely stopped. New episodes of your favorite TV shows indefinitely delayed. But now some talk shows are resuming production, raising new questions and some controversy. A big question in Hollywood, when will high-profile talk shows come back? Getting some answers this morning amid the ongoing writer and actor strikes. The first late night show now returning. Bill Maher announcing overnight that, quote, real time is coming back. Unfortunately, sans writers are writing. Maher adding, the writers have important issues that I sympathize with and hope they are addressed to their satisfaction. But they are not the only people with issues, problems, and concerns. We're still writing things on cards. And many daytime talk shows are back in production. From The View, which never stopped production, to Drew Barrymore, Jennifer Hudson, and reportedly The Talk. All employ unionized writers, but during the strike, The View and Barrymore Show have pledged not to use WGA members, leading to backlash from the Writers Guild. The actor's union, sag aftra says Barrymore is free to host her show. The actress herself posting, I own this choice, and that she's in compliance with strike rules. With no sign of resolution to the strikes, you, the viewer, will also pay a price this fall. With many of your favorite TV shows and movies missing in action, dozens of productions have been shuttered, like highly anticipated movie sequels to Mission Impossible, Deadpool, and Gladiator. Their release is pushed to next year at the earliest. On the TV side, new seasons of popular shows like Stranger Things, Emily in Paris, Abbott Elementary, and Yellowstone now delayed for months. You see what you've been missing? Production on the Game of Thrones prequel has been shut down. It was back in May that WGA writers walked off the job, followed by SAG-AFTRA actors in July. After talks collapsed with the AMPTP, the group representing major studios, including NBC Universal's parent company, Comcast. The battle here over wage increases, residuals in the streaming era, and the use of artificial intelligence. SAG-AFTRA President Fran Drescher pledging to stay the course. Do not give up because this is the moment that is going to change the future. With so many unscripted shows postponed, insiders say expect lots of reruns and reality TV to take their place. Is it snake oil? 
That's what happened in the last writer's strike 16 years ago, when hit reality franchises like NBC's Two Hour Biggest Loser and CBS's Amazing Race were born, dominating the ratings and revolutionizing what we watch forever. Bill Maher added in that statement that despite his assistance, the rest of his staff is, quote, struggling mightily, and he didn't want them to lose out on more work. As for other talk shows using WGA members during the strike, CBS declined to comment about the talk, and CW did not respond to NBC News' request for comment. Back to you. All right, Chloe Malas, thank you so much. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.